Fireside Chat, Episode 21, Preseason Review, recorded September 16th, 2013. Are you ready? See you around. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Welcome back. It's Dan and Matt here with you again. Matt, how you doing tonight? Very good. And it's the eve of the Flames and Senators playing in Saskatoon. And as we record this, the Flames are down one nothing. They've outshot the Sens in the first period, but somehow they're down one nothing. What's going on with this team? Are we losing already? Pretty much, but you know they're giving a good effort anyway. Not a lot's been going on in the Flames world since we last broadcast, but there has been some fairly major stories. And I figured we'd start out by uh, welcoming somebody into the organization and at the same time saying goodbye to a key piece of the organization. So I think the biggest piece of news that all Flames fans will know is that Brian Burke has joined the Calgary Flames. He'll be taking over as president of hockey operations. When you first heard the announcement, Matt, what was your first reaction? I was a little bit on the fence with that, but, you know, there's positives and negatives. I'm not really a fan of uh, Burke's abrasive personality. Uh, I don't think that's, uh, you know, as good of a fit, possibly. But, you know, he is a very competent GM and hockey person, so I can't really complain on that aspect. I said the more bright minds you get, the better your team is going to be. You know, if Jay has more people to put ideas past, more people to go look at players. Yeah, and, you know, some people might have different ideas, and that might spark something that is a positive down the road. So, you know, it's better than having nobody (laughs) to bounce ideas off of. Yeah. I guess to me, my biggest issue is I'm still not really sure um, what his what his role is going to be. I mean, we've never really had a president of, of hockey ops, and it's a role that not a lot of teams have. And the first team that comes to mind is Edmonton, who has one like that. And people always thought that Kevin Lowe's been meddling in trades and that sort of thing. So I don't know if it's going to be a relationship similar to what he had in Toronto, where he did most of the GM work. And the the assistant GMs all did uh, like the paperwork and the day to day management, or exactly what his role is. But I can't see Burke just sitting back and being an advisor. Can you? Well, I don't see him, you know, not having his hands on the reins a bit. But I don't know to what extent that'll be. Yeah, I, for how Feaster's done in the rebuild I, thus far. Like, I can't really complain with any of his moves, so I hope that the Flames don't radically depart from what they've been doing recently. Like, my greatest fear is uh, the Flames pulling something like the Kessel trade, you know, when he was with the Leafs, and sacrificing some of our future for a slightly better young player now type of thing. Because that one did kind of bite the Leafs in the butt a bit. So, yeah, that's my main concern with that. But you're thinking that history might repeat itself and Burke might try to make a similar type of deal again. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't mind, like, if the Flames were had a, more prospects that they could actually start looking at trading two or three of the moderately good ones for a better player, but... You know, right now we're kind of starting from square one practically. And yeah, I think right now we need to hoard the assets we've got in a way. We can't be trading them willy nilly. No. And like it's if they can get enough prospects like that, they can eventually do uh, Mike Richards trade, then fine, go for it. But you know, that we're like two three years away from having that many prospects to even entertain something like that. Yeah, and I think by the time we get that many prospects, and that sort of, not just that many prospects, but that many prospects of that caliber, 
I think that this team's going to be looking at being on the upswing by that point and being kind of coming out of the rebuild and looking at starting to become a contender. So whether you'd want to do that deal at that point or not becomes another question. Yeah, and you'd always be at that point be looking to take the step to put you over the top like the Kings did back a couple years ago. Yeah, but you also don't want to sacrifice the future where we'd have to rebuild again right away. Yeah, it's it's one of those, you know, you have to have the timing all set and done perfectly. The thing that when Burke came here, when I was listening to him talk and um, Ken King talk and that sort of thing, you got this sense that they've been trying to lure Burke here for a while and they talk to a lot of people. And I guess to me, the fact that it took Brian Burke so long to decide if this is a job he wants worries me a little bit because perhaps he's going to find out it's not a job he wants or he's not comfortable in the role and who knows how effective it will be at that point. Well, you know, you hope that when he signed on here he would be giving his full 100% effort. Yeah, I can't really question work ethic. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes. But I, I would expect him to be a little more professional than that the first question that i asked when i heard burke was coming is so do you think we go and try to acquire dion phaneuf back actually i want to but uh, we know how much you paid for it well actually i would think that he'd try to go and get phil kessel who's a free agent at the end of the season first do you think that maybe he can finally get rid of matt stajan who he brought to us well uh, at at the year. end of the year, Stajan's a unrestricted free agent, and if he's performing somewhat well, I expect him to get traded. Actually, I expect all the impending unrestricted free agents to get dealt, so it wouldn't really shock me if he gets traded down the road. So you don't think that the Flames will sign any of their pending free agents? Well, they might sign Camilleri if he wants to stay, but beyond that, yeah, they need to get assets, young assets in the organization, and realistically the only way to do that is through the draft, so trading off your vet, some of your vets for picks, and then in free agency sign a few guys just to hit the floor would make sense, and like if phil kessel becomes an unrestricted free agent you know you can actually target him so everything just yeah i guess you know i wouldn't think phil kessel would sign here but we've seen crazier things well david moss was his cousin or is his cousin so he would have some David moss isn't here anymore though yeah but he would know what it's like here so yeah, who knows how close they are? I mean, I have cousins that I haven't talked to in years. True. Who knows? Maybe they maybe they don't talk. Maybe there's some sort of family rift. Yeah. <laughs> who knows? So while we're saying, you know, welcoming Brian Burke into the organization, I think time will tell on that one if it's a good deal or not. I'm like you. I have mixed emotions on it. It could be good. It could be... Um, you know, it turned out to, I wouldn't say a bad deal, but perhaps there's too much butting heads and too much politics in the office. But while we're saying, welcoming Brian Burke and saying hello to him, we are saying goodbye to a cornerstone of the Flames franchise for, oh, as long as probably most fans can remember. And that's Mika Kiprasov, who finally announced what we all knew was coming, his retirement. He won't be coming back this year. Well, there's not really much that you can say about Kipper that hasn't already been said. He's the best goalie the Flames have ever had, and it'll be a long time before we have anybody that is even in, remotely in the same conversation. So, you know, I wish him all the best, and, you know, thanks for everything that he did for the organization and the fans. What's your most fond Kipper memory? That one save against Wellwood where he had the wide open net and he dove across. That was, you know, I I was at that game and I just I still can't believe he made that save. The highlight of every goalie's career, making a save on Kyle Wellwood. I'm sure that's the one he'll remember too. <laughs> you know, I was looking back on his career not too long ago 
and um, just you know looking at stats, looking at stuff like that. If you look at when we acquired him, he was a third string goaltender in Edmonton, behind Nabokov and Toskala, and really I think he's had the best career of the three of those guys. It's shocking that the Sharks had such goaltending depth at the time that they were willing to get rid of Kipper. And I don't know if it's a bad scouting move on their part, but I mean we sure got a heck of a goaltender for what we paid for him, which was a yeah. second round pick. Well, they did have that one good draft where they got all of Johan Hedberg, Toskala, Nabokov, and Kipper. So they were kind of swimming in goalies for a while there. You know, at the time, Kipper wasn't showing that he was the best of the three. So, you know, it, I can understand at the time why they went with the other two guys because they were a little more consistent. At Kipper was like when he was on, he was good. When he wasn't, he was bad. And with San Jose, he was more bad than you know, really good. And it wasn't until he came to Calgary that he really turned it on the good bar and left it there. <laughs> yeah, my favorite Kipper memory, and it's gonna sound really cliche, but um. One of them was just that 2004 run and the fact that this goaltender nobody knew, nobody had heard of, nobody really knew much about, led this team and did you know fantastic things that we as Flames fans hadn't seen in a while. I remember before him, our most popular goaltender in recent memory was probably Freddie Brathwaite, which is a sad thing to say as a Flames fan. But, um, you know, Kipper was popular and he captured all of our hearts. And I, I really, I think that... That run in 04 really solidified me that, yeah, this guy's the right goaltender for the team. Mm -hmm. The other one was Kipper Kid, which I know wasn't actually Kipper, but I always love seeing that kid who you stand behind him and emulate all his moves. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's sad Kipper's leaving. We've talked a lot about it, but it's a new generation for this team, and I think it's a fitting kind of signal that it's time to move on. It's that fitting end. Jerome's gone, Kipper's gone, Bo Meester's gone. It's kind of that turning over of a new leaf. Yeah, pretty much everybody is out the door, so, you know, it's on to the fresh faces, the Monahans, the Berchies, the Poiriers, and hopefully we see some good talent come from the group of prospects that we have right now, and, you know, it'll be interesting to see how all the players develop over the next couple of seasons and see, like, who actually takes off and who struggles a bit and all that. It's a lot more interesting of a story than, oh, are we going to possibly finish an eighth this year? Exactly. And I think the big difference there, I've been thinking about this, for the last three, four, five, I don't know how many exactly years, management has been promising fans a playoff spot, and they've been disappointing fans every year. And I think that's a lot of the reason why we as Flames fans get so angry, because every year they tell us we're a playoff team, we're a playoff team, and they disappoint us. I mean, this year we know, I mean, you know, Jay Feasters used that word rebuild. We know what to expect from this team, so I don't think anyone's going to be upset if this team ends up in the you know last place in the West or second last in the West. I don't think they're going to end up last in the West, but I don't think anyone would be disappointed if they do. Well, the Flames are pretty much the only team without a legit starting goalie, so I don't really see how they finish any higher than 15th. But, you know, it would be a, one of those situations where you go, what is wrong with your team for anybody that does finish behind this? <laughs> You know, I look down the roster, and I'm actually quite happy with the training camp roster this year. I mean, we have a really good mix of young guys who've never played in the NHL, rookies, guys who played one or two years, and also some veterans like, you know, Hoodler, Jackman, uh, some of the guys we brought in like David Jones and Shane O'Brien. So I think there's a really interesting mix of players this year, and I think it's going to be really interesting to watch these positional battles happen and see who's able to win themselves a spot. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I noticed uh, during the uh, uh, training camp scrimmage on Sunday was that the, l the level of play from the older rookies like Hanowski and that 
and the better guys like Poirier and Monaghan, the, their skill level and overall game isn't actually that much of a step down from the veteran players that we're playing. So it's going to be a very wide open training camp. And like if the Feaster as, keeps to his word with if a rookie outplays a veteran or they are tied, then the spot will go to the rookie. I could actually see quite a few players possibly losing spots because of that. So you think that we may see a bunch of NHL faces or guys that we would expect to be NHL faces on this team end up um, playing in the NHL perhaps or being put on waivers? Yeah. Well, like... I mean, they'd all have to clear waivers either way if they're veterans. Yeah. Well, with um, specifically Hanowski, I think he'll actually make the team outright on the fourth line because he his smarts and how he approaches the game are quite good and his skating has improved so between the two i think he might be good enough just to have a third or fourth line spot you know and if you lose a guy like tim jackman it's not the end of the world yeah I was reading today in the paper, in the uh, Calgary Sun, that Paul Byron is really pushing for a spot this year too and that he knows what he did wrong last year and he's really worked on fixing it and the coaches are pleased with what they're seeing so far. Yeah, and from what I've seen of him as well, he's been markedly better than last year or the year before. And John Joris actually, he also looks really good out there as well. Which is surprising. Joris was the player that you highlighted from the rookie camp in uh, January. He was, or, or in July, sorry. He was a unrestricted free agent that we signed, right? Yeah, and he's looked like a an actual NHL player, which is surprising considering he was just a walk on. Yeah, and a guy who's never even played at like the CHL level or anything. He's played. It looks like college his whole career so far. Yeah, and. Yeah, you know, when it comes to college players, if you're putting up 30 to 35 points like Joris did, usually those type of players tend to be solid AHL players that, you know, like your AHL scores like Ben Street. And once in a while, one of those guys will actually translate into the NHL, like P.A. Parento, or even uh, David Moss. He was actually one of those as well. So... You know, maybe Joris actually is one of those niche players that actually manages to overcome the lack of offensive production at that level. Who knows, but he is giving quite a good effort. Well, you're forgetting another and maybe one of the most important to the Flames right now, a walk-on player, which is Mark Giordano. He was a free agent acquisition from the Flames on uh, in July of 2004. So he was never drafted, and he's turned out to be a, a pretty solid NHL player, I think we'd all agree. Yeah. Well, actually, Weidman attended the same rookie camp that Geo did. But we did Here sign in Calgary, him, really. Uh, the St. Louis Blues did. Yeah, and oh. the Flames wanted to sign him then, but the Blues had a better offer. So, Weidman got drafted, though, didn't he? No. Not that the I Flames know. Flames website says he was he was drafted by Buffalo. Well, he might have been drafted round, by him. Yeah, but he might have just went back in the draft unsigned. So yeah, they could have drafted him eighth, not signed him, and then he went back as a as a UFA or went back into the draft. So yeah, that could be. Is there anyone I know you did if, on the last episode kind of an extensive breakdown of the July rookie camp? Based on what you saw last week with the two games against Edmonton and the scrimmage you went to, any one that you've changed your mind on either way, guys that are looking better or guys that are looking worse from when you saw them in July? Uh, the one guy that looked a lot better like was Yanni Ordio. Like he did not look like he even wanted to be there in July. Like he was not giving any effort and like it was quite frustrating cuz you know, he had good stats last year, and, you know, you're expecting him to sh- have shown some improvement, but in July he was looking just as 
poorly as he did when he went back to Finland. But last week he was actually, you know, he stole the show. He was looking like Kipper in that. So, you know, he's back in the mix for possibly being one of the NHL goalies this year. It just, you know, it with all the young players, it's just a wait and see if they take advantage of the opportunity. Yeah, well, and when Feaster says that if a young player can at least tie for a spot with a, a veteran and they will get that spot, maybe I'm being naive, but I believe Feaster. I mean, we're in a rebuild. We want to be bringing the young players up. So I really I believe that, and I think it's a great opportunity for all these guys. Well, I, with uh, the goalies, I think that the Flames should actually go with the three-headed monster with having Barra and Ramo as well as Joey McDonald, and, like, each game have McDonald as the backup in the game, and have, basically have them rotate in, like, if you win, you play the next game, and, you know, to give each of them about 15 games or so to see, like, what you've got, because back when uh, Pekka Rene came up with the Predators, uh, he was... It was like his third or fourth game he played in Calgary. And, like, the Flames scored six goals on him in, like, the first period. It, and, like, two minutes. I remember that yeah. game, yeah. And, like, he did not even look like an NHL goalie. It's like, why do you have this peewee guy in here type skill level guy in there? Like, yeah. My grandpa could tend better net with his walker. Yeah. And, you know, uh, flash forward a couple of months and, like, he's starting to come into his own and you know a seven year 49 million dollar contract a few years later yeah that's not bad so you know you just don't know what you've got until they actually get some time and you know like joey mcdonald he doesn't really matter as much because he's 34 but both ramo and barra are in that age range where Kipper was when he came to Calgary initially so you know you just don't know what you've got until they either sink or swim and especially with goalies it's a real toss-up because who knows yeah I think Joey McDonald's uh, job as the backup is secured I don't think they're gonna put one of those other guys as the backup I like your idea of the three-headed monster my only worry though is having a young goaltender like uh, Red Obara or Kerry Ramo not get, I mean, they're 26 and 27 respectively, but not getting enough starts. I think I'd be okay doing something like that, say, until Christmas and then picking one. But I don't know if doing that all season would get each guy enough games to really be able to evaluate him at the NHL level. Yeah. I was thinking, like, at worst, like, till January, but, you know, it's about right. Yeah, put them in. You know, rotate them till Christmas, like you said. If you win, you play. If you lose, you sit. Something like that. Um, I believe Barra still does not have to clear waivers to go to the farm. Though I could be wrong. Do you know what his waiver status is? I think that both of them would have to clear waivers due to the age of the player. Because I think it's okay, till you're 25, so... you're exempt unless you've played an X number of games. And they're 26 yeah, I think and you're 27, right. so I think they're both, they'd have to clear. Yeah, like, realistically, if we sent Barra down, I doubt anybody would claim him, because here's a 26-year-old goalie that's never played in the NHL, and he's not even good enough to be the backup on a team without a starting goaltender. You know what I mean? Like... You're not really going to... If we send him down before the season, I agree with you. But if we send him down, say, in uh, January, and he's put some good wins together, well, but Ramos just looked better... Well, then you'd get rid of McDonald. Yeah. Yeah, that's another way to do it, I guess. Yeah. Like, if they're both looking like good goalies, then just get rid of the other guy and let the them two battle it out. Yeah, I didn't think of that. That's a good idea. So based on what you've seen of those two, if you were um, the coach right now, if you were the head coach or the goalie coach, whoever makes that final decision, uh, who would you be putting between the pipes for the opening game? 
Uh, that's a real tough one. Um, for how they've played thus far, I would lean Barra, but that's only because Ramos seems a little unsettled in his net, and he, like, most goalies, like, they're very centered in how they move in that, to adjust to the angles and such, but, like, he just, it doesn't look right when he's playing, and, you know, it, it'd be a toss-up, but I'd probably go with Barrett just because he's been good in each of the appearances I've seen him in, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of having the same dilemma that you are when I think about it. Um, Barra has been the better goaltender so far in preseason, I think. I might lean towards Ramo just because I think he's the guy who has to lose the job. I think he's kind of the forerunner right now for that job. So I might almost put him in in the first game to see how he does in an actual NHL game, like one that counts, and let him, I guess, lose that job instead of letting instead of making Barra win it, if that makes sense. Yeah. That's basically how I feel about it. And with having the three-headed monster in Calgary with Barra, Ramo, and McDonald, it also frees up both Brassois and Ordeo to be in Abbotsford instead of having one mm-hmm. of them go to Alaska. So there's that factor as well. Yeah. And, you know, looking around the league, there are a couple other NHL teams that don't have a lot of prospect goaltenders. So I was looking around the other day. I don't have the list of teams on me anymore, but it's possible we could put one of those guys in another AHL market if need be as well. Yeah. Which I know you don't want to loan players out very much, but for a goaltender, I'd rather loan them out and get them to play a majority of games than split them with another goalie on our farm team. True. It just depends. (laughs) <laughs> really yeah no that's true I think um, you know we could sit here and we could go through the whole roster and try to think who we think is going to get cut but it's it's tough at this point to know who's going to make the team who's not there's a lot of guys that are making a claim that they should be in the NHL yeah um, I guess the big the big one I'm thinking of is do you think that Monaghan's going to be called up to the NHL this year I think he will get nine games, whether or not he goes beyond that. I don't know. I don't think he's. You think he's going to have to prove himself in those nine games? Yeah, he hasn't been outstanding in any of the games and such. So, you know, it just it depends. Yeah, it it's only like the second game of the training camp, so you know there's still so many games that have to be played to get a more complete body of work. Um, yeah, I think Poirier might have a shot at nine games, which you know surprises me a bit, but he's looked extremely good. Pretty much, other than the first day of that development camp in July, like, he's been awesome the whole time. Yeah, I think, you know, at this point, um, from what I've seen, Monaghan hasn't, I won't, don't want to say hasn't impressed me, but he hasn't looked like he deserves to play 82 games at the NHL level this year. I think to send him back down to the W, or to the uh, CHL for another year of conditioning would be a good idea, um... I can I agree with you. I might bring him up for nine games, let him see what's going on. Maybe he becomes an injury fill in. Who knows? But yeah, I just don't think he's ready for a full season. Yeah, and at least if you give him nine games, he can go back to Ottawa and know what it takes to be in the NHL. And that's why I yeah, kinda sure. give Poirier the same shot, just because like he has been good. So okay, well this is what you actually need to do. And go back and, you know, kick ass in your season and, you know, see you again next year. (laughs) Yeah, and sometimes that's all they need is just have a little bit more time to, you know, be in the NHL. See what that is. See what that means to people and really, you know, go from there. 
and um, you know figure out what do I need to change about myself to I guess be able to make it at this level mm-hmm Exactly, and like that's why I don't mind. Like even if uh, Patrick Sealaw, because he's been also rather impressive, him getting a shot, and as well to see, like what it is at the NHL level before sending him back as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the thing. I think there's a lot of guys. I wouldn't give them all shots at the same time, and I might wait for some of them to have. Um, you know, to for us to run into injury problems and use them as an injury call up. But yeah, I can definitely see on a year like this, where I don't want to say our roster doesn't matter, but let's say that we have more flexibility in what we do with our roster, that we'll see these guys come up at various different times in the year. Yeah, there's no real corners. Get tried out. Yeah, there's no real cornerstones in the organization right now, so it's pretty much a mixed grab bag. Just anybody that's doing good enough to take a spot, you get it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, like, one of the things that the Flames have quite a lot of is quality third and fourth line caliber players in that are on the verge knocking at the door to be full-time NHL players like Reinhardt, Horak, Hanowski, Knight, and so on. And, you know, like, it'll be interesting to see, like will they actually get spots on the team full time or is it going to be like calling up Reinhardt for two weeks and then sending him down and then calling up Panowski and then sending him down and you know what I mean like cycling him through Mm -hmm. well and that can be a bad thing too because if you don't give a guy enough time I mean, it's got to be, I've never played an NHL game in my life, but it's got to be, you know, a bit nerve-wracking to get called up to the NHL and play that first game. So if you keep calling guys up and putting them down, you may not be seeing the best work that these guys can give you, the best body of work, because they're simply not playing enough games. Yeah. So I think there is that fine balance between how many guys you bring up, and also chemistry, right? I mean, you want to see the guys who are on the team and what kind of chemistry they have, and if they're changing line mates every nine games, that can be hard on them too. Yeah, definitely. Um, One guy you did mention, Corbin Knight, do you think he's got a spot on the team this year? I think he'll probably... His overall play hasn't been that great, but... He is exceptionally good in the faceoff circle. So I could see him making the team as the fourth line center and, you know, just learning how to play at the NHL level, even though he might not be quite ready for it. Like, he's not a bad player by any stretch. Like, he'd probably be the best fourth line center we've had in a half decade. But, you know, there's still some rough edges that he needs to work on. And, like, the more consistency in his game overall from shift to shift. But, you know, just having him out there winning face-offs, that's huge. Like, having Monaghan out there as well. Like, in the, the game that was here um, against Edmonton, like, it was remarkable to actually see the Flames consistently winning most of the draws all night. Like, it's, like, completely foreign from past years where you know it was pretty much automatic that the other team would get the puck to start the play yeah do you think that maybe corbin knight becomes a 13th forward a guy that you know what he's maybe not as polished as some other guys but because of that face-off ability they keep him on as the injury replacement forward I don't think that'd be great for his overall development. Like, I I think if he's not going to be playing every day, then send him to Abbotsford to play on the top six, in the top six. But, you know, I think he's got enough of this game that's good enough to be a fourth-line player. Like, it's not really a high threshold to be, you know... For this team this year to be the fourth line center isn't a big no like big you know like you're trying to beat out guys like Tim Jackman like you know you should be able to beat Tim Jackman yeah you know like if you can't beat him out for a spot like then 
you know, like, you don't really deserve to be in the NHL at this point, <laughs> so, you know, That's a good I mean, way to like, look at it. Oh, uh, I was just gonna say, like, it's not like he's been terrible or anything, like, he, his overall game is quite solid, it's just that he's not 100% there, if that makes sense, like, it's just not clicking yeah. for him right now. And who knows if that's a mental issue or maybe there's, you know, an injury we don't know about. But And that's something that they could work through with him during the season as well. Yeah, and, you know, he is 23, I think, so he's more than... Yeah, he's 23. So he's more than ready to go as a young player. So you're kind of thinking he's close enough. Let's put him on the team and see what we can do with him over an 82-game schedule. Yeah, like we're rebuilding. And in order to rebuild, you need to give guys that have you know, exceptional skills at, you know, certain aspects of the game, a shot, like, Knight is that good in the face-off circles, so give him the shot and see if he can figure out how to play properly at the NHL level with the rest of his game, and, you know, like, I see his upside being, like, a 30-40 point third-line center, maybe down the road, Wow. so sort of like a not quite as good version of David Boland if he okay. gets all the pieces in the right manner. So, Well, you're saying, you know, you have to play guys um, when you're rebuilding. And I think, too, when you're rebuilding, you also have to take chances and you have to experiment and perhaps experiments you wouldn't do otherwise. Yeah. So I'm I'm thinking that perhaps um you know giving him a shot maybe he's not a guy that in a, in a better year we would look at as that fourth line center, um but you know this year let's give it a shot and I mean what have we got to lose? Yeah, exactly. It's not like we're, we're going to make the playoffs, last. so why not? Yeah, and like that's yeah, exactly the thing. Like the Flames have quite a few players that are prospects that are twenty three, twenty four in that range. Those are the guys that you need to start cycling into the lineup regularly to see if they're actually NHL players or not. And so that way you can free up. If they're not, you can either trade them or, you know, just let them go in a year or two type of thing. So, you know, you have to do the evaluations that way as well. Yeah, or I mean, even if you don't let them go, there may be a chance that somebody hits a hot streak and you can flip them sometime during the season for a you know, late-round draft pick. Yeah, exactly. Like Blake Como type of thing. Yeah, tra- you know, odd deals are done at the deadline, but also as injuries come up and salary cap issues come up, I think the Flames have a lot of pieces. that they, well, I, We wouldn't get a big return for them, but they have a lot of pieces that they can move for something in the future. Exactly. And, yeah, that's the whole thing with the rebuild. It's a numbers game. And seeing who exactly will rise to the top. And, like, that becomes your core of your team. And everybody that's below that threshold, those are the guys that you try and trade for areas of need down the road. Like Mike Richards for Shannon Simmons. That kind of thing. Well, unless you got anything else to talk about with this team, I figure let's move on to one of the most, I guess, odd and perhaps funny flame stories in a while. Um, Ryan House refuses to report to training camp. Yeah, I guess he's just not into playing hockey anymore, he was saying. So, yeah, if your heart's not in it, then go do something else. Like, me personally, I always give 100% with whatever I'm doing. And like if I'm not, my heart's not in it. I'm not going to be giving a, uh, you know, the quality is just not going to be there. So, you know, yeah, I can. That's it. I'd rather he leave than um, play and put in half the effort and take other people down with him. Take the guys in his line down because they're not getting the effort they need. Yeah, exactly. Like, it, it, you know, we only have so many contracts and so many roster spots. So if your heart's not in it then let somebody else take your spot. Yeah, and, you know, I'll I'll read the quote here from Jay Feaster. Quote, Ryan had indicated to us through Craig Conroy a few days before he was scheduled to come in for rookie camp, and he'd indicated he wasn't sure he wanted to play. End quote. So, I don't know, 
to me kind of odd to get a hold of them just a couple days for a rookie camp. You think that's probably something that you knew ahead of time. Um, but, you know, like you said, better to know that and have him not come to rookie camp than to play him and take up a contract or something like that. Yeah. It's too bad, too, because he was seen as a highly touted prospect for this organization. A lot of people really thought Ryan House had a future. It's one of those things that, you know, if you, you're you're just not interested in playing anymore, then, you know, find whatever it is that makes floats your boat. And, like, I wish all the best of luck with him, so... Yeah, best of luck to him, and hopefully he finds whatever it is his yeah. passion is. I'm trying to remember. There's another guy that something like this happened to. Is it yeah. Dan Ryder or something? Somebody yeah. else who. Although he. It, and what what was the story with Dan I Ryder? Think he Do you had remember? Addiction issues, and I think he got arrested for something, if I recall. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just kind of fell off the rails there. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I, I remember there's some other prospect a couple of years ago. And had a similar thing happen where he just didn't report to camp and nobody knew what happened to him. Dan Ryder's back, though, I think. So hopefully he's got his life back on track. He's playing in the AHL, if I remember correctly. Huh, I didn't know that. So, good for him. If he was able to get his life back on track, good for him. Well, Matt, any other uh, Flames topics you think deserve our time this week? Uh, not really. I just... I'm looking forward to the next two weeks to see how all the kids play, you know, and how they stack up against the veteran forwards and all that. It'll definitely be interesting to see. I think that's going to be exciting. As a Flames fan, I think it'll be exciting to see how this shakes out. Yeah. And we have to wait till October 3rd for the first... uh, regular season game and that's the flames visiting the capitals so hopefully we'll we'll have a i mean good is a relative term but hopefully we're going to have an exciting roster this year something that the flames want to see and perhaps a team that we all want to watch yeah. develop together but i'm hoping it'll be a, a team that we're proud to well, put the see on i'm just looking forward to you know something interesting that's compelling like seeing like how is Berchi going to fare how is Monahan gonna do is Sealoff gonna become a stalwart on the defense core like Regeer did you know like all those stories you know like it's more interesting than oh the flames are four points out of eight you know can they make it <laughs> and then they go on a four game losing streak <laughs> I think it'll be interesting, but I also think it won't be disappointing. No, and like, you kind of expect them to finish last or second last in the NHL. So, you know, I wouldn't really worry about, like, oh, we lost again. Just, like, try to look at the positives instead of, you know, dwelling on, oh, we're, you know, basically Edmonton a couple years ago. So... <laughs> You know, yeah, and look for it. Well, and you and I have, you and me and Luke have talked about that for a while. That this team is going to be a different team this year. Excuse me, and our definition of success is going to change. So, as fans, we need to expect some different from yeah. this team. And look for the little positives, like does TJ Galliardi uh, rekindle his scoring touch? Does Chris Russell actually emerge as an NHL defenseman? Instead of someone that's an in-betweener. You know, like all those little things. You know, the positives with each of the players. Yeah, can can a, can a small guy like a Mark Kandari show that he deserves a, a full-time NHL spot on this team? And yeah, I think it's going to be exciting for that reason. But for once, the team isn't hyping up the whole, we're going to be a playoff team. Only for us to be disappointed two months into the season. So I'm really looking forward to seeing... Uh, what the team does, where they go, and watching these young guys develop for us. And I think it's one of these things that as Flames fans, if we stick with the team now and we're interested in watching what happens with these young guys, we'll be the ones that are rewarded later when we're all sitting around talking about, you know, so-and-so's rookie year or, you know, sticking it out with them through the bad times. And 
Yeah. I'm excited as a Flames fan to see what we get yeah, this year. Yeah, and it's a lot more interesting this year than even last year or the year before because, like, there's no, like, preconceptions that, oh, this is supposed to be this way. And, you know, you, you can't get disappointed if you're going in thinking that you're going to be thir- the 30th place team. You know, if you actually become that. Yeah. So, you know, just... Feaster's not telling us it's a competitive no. roster this so year. So just basically sit back, have fun, and just cheer them on, and hopefully the players develop into good players down the road. Yeah. Exactly. This is our this is our kind of year to plant seeds and see what works and have some experiments and as fans to really watch that interesting dynamic of a rebuild that I don't really think our team's ever formally gone through. Um, we had some crappy years, but we were never really no. rebuilding the team. So I think it, I think it's going to yeah. be a lot of fun. And you know, it'll be interesting at the end of the year if we're picking in the top three. If we'll get one of the two former Flames uh, from before, either Reinhardt or Nylander. So got that to look forward to as well. Yeah. And you know, as much as. I don't think it's probably likely. You know, we have... I mean, when we hired Mika Kippersoff, we didn't think he was going to turn out to be the player that he did. So, who knows? Maybe we're all going to be surprised this year. Maybe somebody like a Red Obara or a Mark Kandari or one of those guys that we've kind of pigeonholed as a third or fourth line guy or a backup goalie or a fourth line center is going to really surprise us. And it's going to be interesting to watch that player develop this year. I can't wait. Well, uh, I think we'll uh, we'll come back and do another show probably just before the season starts after training camp and talk about who's made the team, any shocks we have, that sort of thing. Yeah. Sound Definitely. good to you? All right, well, then then I think we'll sign off for the night. Um, as always, we encourage people to check out the website. Matt's done a lot of writing there at firesidechat.ca. So you can go view all the latest podcasts. You can read some of Matt's articles. And you can also follow us on Twitter, we're at Fireside Podcast, or on Facebook, we're facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. So hopefully you'll, you'll hit us up, follow us on whatever network you use, um, keep in touch with us, and we're hoping for a great season both for the Flames and for the show. Have a good one, everyone. See you next week, Matt. Yeah, take care. We are the boys of chorus, we hope you like our show. We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.